Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Sean. I guess start here. It's it's the two edges of the sword that come with wanting to protect something. It seems like it's too good to be true, David. You know, my CPA would have heard about this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. why why hasn't why hasn't someone else told me about it? What why isn't everyone doing it? You know, and mm -hmm. so if so, I don't know if you've heard that yet, uh, I hear it yeah. about every day. But what what would be your response to that? And it's usually got an element of sort of not distrust or so. Oh, hold on now, wait a minute now, you know. Um, and so um, it's 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 the two edges of the sword that come with wanting to protect something. In order to protect something, anything, a great business idea, intellectual property with a patent. Uh, a transaction type, which in this case has uh, certain legal and other protections uh, so that no one importantly can take the really good idea and go basically duplicate it. That's important. Um, but more importantly, take the good idea and mess it up. Mm -hmm. So in a strange way, when you are protecting anything, right? Um, it also places some limitations on its broad use. Not everybody can see it or access it. It's not perfectly transparent or out floating around on the internet. We expect everything to be Googleable, right? Well, this isn't Googleable, at least not in terms of the detail, because there's no way to do that uh, and make it that broadly available without protecting it to make sure it stays. It's done right. Look, we, we have this conversation about the asset portfolio. Um, where the nature of it is that the asset, the investments must perform within a range. And the range is fairly generous and there's some flexibility. But the point is, all of the parts, the legal structure, the, the tax uh, elements, uh, deferment elements, uh, and the investment elements, they all have to work together in harmony and they all have to perform. If any one of them breaks, then you know we have a problem and it's my reputation and it's your reputation it's bob binkley's reputation and you know these these are serious folks um I, I think of myself as a fairly serious person so my entire life developing my my credibility and my reputation and i'm not about to throw it away so in a strange way the the activity of protecting that that sanctity results in the fact that it isn't as widely known as you otherwise think it might be that's actually a good thing Right, it is actually a good thing, right? And and I and I and it's it's why it's been twenty five years now plus thousands of closes, billions under management, over a dozen no change successful IRS audits, mm -hmm. um, and because it's just an installment sale, right? Now we're created with a third party unrelated trustee, which is what the services we provide here at Capital Gains Tax Solutions. But it takes a team of professionals to execute this in a, in a way that um, that maintains the the law of IRC four fifty three. And that is uh, that's important to mention. By the way, we also think and believe and would hope to think that the um, just the same fact that you can diversify the wealth, the IRS also says that you know could think and would believe that you're going to diversify the, the the taxes being paid, right? Because this is truly deferral. This isn't avoidance, right? What mm -hmm. we're saying is we're, they're actually locking in the gain, you know, versus the 1031 exchange where it's you know right as it stands right now, it's kind of you can drop into your swap or swap into your drop. And in 2008, when things were not diversified, and if you're trading one single asset for another single asset, mm -hmm. taking on a bunch of debt, guess what? Things can stop, and all of a sudden, that gain gets wiped out. Mm -hmm. And guess who else who doesn't get the tax on that? The IRS. Whereas in the Deferred Sales Trust, we're taking that gain, and we're kind of locking it in, and we're preserving it, right? And we're going to spread it across potentially 100 different investments and 100 different companies, right? From different countries, different areas, different, uh, it can be real estate, it can be stocks, right? It can be hard money lending. It can be a number of things. And therefore, it increases the chances of, of when you receive payment, you'll pay tax. Also, by the way, it gets new property taxes, right? Because the property sells. Um, the, the agent gets the, gets the listing. He, he has to pay tax on the commission. So it's actually a win, win, win. You're muted, Brett. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Brett Swartz. I'm excited to have you a part of another Capital Gains Tax Solutions Deferred Sales Trust Mastermind. And we're talking about how to defer capital gains tax on the sale of Bitcoin profits and other highly appreciated assets. 
Around here, we believe that most high net worth individuals and those who help them, they struggle with clarifying their capital gains tax deferral options, especially when it comes to selling, again, things that are uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, NFTs. Um, it could be a business, it could be real estate, it could be a dental practice, it could be um, anything that's highly appreciated where you're looking at huge capital gains taxes. And our goal is to help you create a plan, a clear plan, and not having a clear plan is the enemy, but creating a clear plan and clear exit strategy before you exit is the best way for you to preserve and create and pr create more wealth as you exit these highly appreciated assets. And so um, we're, uh, we're very passionate about that and we're excited for you to join us today, wherever you might be listening to this on iTunes or on YouTube or on Facebook. And so with that being said, I'm, I've got, I'm here with one of my, uh, my co-hosts and he's now uh, uh, working with me. He's a business partner of mine. His name is Pierce York and he's out of the great S Southern California area. Pierce, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Happy Christmas. Hey, Merry Christmas to you, my friend. And, um, tell Thank me how was, well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so Pierce officially, by the way, for those who don't know, I've been following this journey as of last week, he did two interviews, two, I think two, interviews uh on taking over some of the podcast um 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 responsibilities there pierce how did that go i think they went pretty well still a little learning curve but we'll get there we're, we're heading in the right direction absolutely and uh pierce's focus is luxury high-end home sales using the deferred sales trust as well as all things deferred sales trust in the southern california region and um, also joined by uh, Mitch Bloom, um, who is out of Colorado, financial advisor and strategic alliance of ours. And Mitch, how you doing today? Uh, hey, you know, Brett, I've, I've never been better. Thanks for asking. Yeah, absolutely. Good to have you. Good to have you. And we also have Sean. I think this is the second time, Sean, you being here. And, and Sean uh, is a real estate professional uh, with EXP, which is also what we're a part of as well with our brokerage arm. Sean, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Brett. Excellent. So our goal here today, guys, and for anyone who's listening, is just to tell you a little bit about the vision, which we shared a little bit in the beginning, and then talk about a deal close story, bring to life what we're talking about, and then to answer frequently asked questions that come up from, from the audience. And anyone who's listening to this can always come every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time to be a part of this mastermind, this Deferred Sales Trust University, and to, again, make these simple for you so that you can you can um, go ahead and use the Deferred Sales Trust for yourself and feel confident about it. And or if you're working, if you're a business professional, business broker, M&A advisor, cryptocurrency influencer, financial advisor, uh, commercial real estate agent, luxury agent, you can come and join us as well. So, Pierce, do you want to kick us off with uh, some of the vision? I touched about it. I touched on it a little bit, but I think it'd be good for folks to hear from you as well. Yeah, sure. So, um, I think that the grand vision is to is to help people um, kind of not avoid, but defer the capital gains tax on their highly appreciated assets, so we can create and preserve more wealth. Um, and it's 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 generational. It's transformational. Um, kind of wealth creation and, and preservation strategy that we're uh, implementing. It, it is able to help a, a ton of people in a ton of different situations. And so if we can, um, you know, kind of help them to get time back, get, uh, you know, financial freedom, get um, unlock some of the equity in, in some of these assets that they've had in order to leverage it to, um, you know, cash flow and, and retire and, do all sorts of things. So it's, um, I think really the overarching goal is to, is to become, um, you know, financially free and secure and then get your time back. Absolutely. And I like to say cash flow equals time squared, right? We mm -hmm. all have the same amount of time, but if you can get cash flow from something, you can like square your time, meaning, um, take an asset that's highly appreciated that might not be producing cash flow, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? and move it and transition it into a cash flowing producing asset that's predictable, that's consistent, that's safe, then that can give you some time back. Now you can, of course, you can stake, you can stake Bitcoin and Ethereum and you can stake these different, different coins and get cash flow. So it's not that you can't do that, but it's subject to these big highs and these big lows. And that leads us into our first deal close story, which I want to share with everybody. And it comes, uh, from a, um, a gentleman who worked for 20 years in the tel uh, Silicon, Silicon Valley tech industry. And I originally grew up in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, helping my mom and dad build custom homes all throughout the Bay Area. 
and it was a time in the 1980s, you know, my dad, I remember he got the first Apple computer and it was like, oh my gosh, like the computer and we played little games on there and stuff and kind of, kind of click around and know what we're doing, uh, you know, before, before the internet and just, uh, just some standard games. But I remember the, the energy and the excitement of the of the computer world and how it was changing changing the world and how you know we grew up in the 90s and it just kept growing and growing and growing well cryptocurrency is happening the same way and this gentleman named his name is peter I actually wrote a blog and go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com and look up the blog on on peter's story and essentially he's been in that world and he's been serving and and he's a tech uh technologist and what he's been doing for multiple companies and over time he started to see and understand cryptocurrency and from its infancy and started to buy Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mostly Ethereum is where he took heavier, heavier positions and saw his about $100,000 investment. He started putting $2,000, you know, a month just out of his, out of his W2 income, right? Working the, you know, the 50 hour a week, uh, work week and, and just was dollar cost averaging in. And I remember sitting down with he and his wife um, in the East Bay at their house going through this. And I was saying, oh, what did you think of this time? She goes, oh, I didn't even know. I didn't even know that uh, he was investing. Um, he was kind of doing this on the side and, and things were going up until one day we sat down and it was like an anniversary dinner, like a special dinner. And he's like, he's like, he, and he told me, Hey, I have something to tell you. And she's, he thought it was going to be some kind of big bombshell, something that's going to be weird or odd. And he's like, no, I just, I've been buying this, uh, cryptocurrency. And she's like, Bitcoin. He's like, well, it's kind of, it's like, it's like Ethereum. And she's like, well, what's it worth? And he's like, well, how much you put into it? She's like, he's like about a hundred thousand dollars. She's like, really? And what's it worth? He's like $6 million. And she's like, sell everything. He's like, no, 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 honey, understand. Like, this is just the infancy, right? Just like the computers change the world, cryptocurrency is going to change the world. And I see the future. And she didn't really understand it as much. You know, she had heard of it, but it wasn't something she really followed like Peter did. And so for her, this represented freedom. And for her, it was time. And for her, not only just freedom for, for herself and her family, but for Peter having to work the W-2 job. And so her mind was like, sell it, be done. Let's take, let's take the, take the gains, take the 6 million. Let's get it off of, of the, of the roller coaster, the highly, highly, um, you know, volatile market and let's put it into some cash flow. He's like, yes, but here's the challenge. Our gain is about $5.9 million. And so we're in California. That's a huge amount of tax and, uh, about 30%, maybe 37%, depending on how, how, how you check that out with where, where they were at. And they're going, this is such a big tax that I can't stomach paying the tax. And so, and this is right around the 2017 range, okay, when things kind of really went boom in, in crypto, especially in Ethereum. And so they settled on, okay, we're going to sell something as soon as we find a capital gains tax referral strategy that makes sense. And so that began their journey. But guess what? They ran out of time. And this is the one thing we can't get back between the time they wanted to sell, decided to sell, had a strategy for what to do afterwards, which was retiring from their W-2 job. And she, she worked as an attorney. He goes, the market fell apart and it, we were devastated. I mean, it went from like 6 million to, I think it went back down to like one, you know, like, or, <laughs> or five, something's crazy. It was just, it was just like completely devastating, right? Sometimes. And so a couple years go by, they still don't know us by the way, right? In fact, fast forward 2000, 2021, um, in the beginning of the year, they learn about the deferred sales trust. And at this point, their Ethereum is right around, uh, I think it was around, 8 million and then it went to 9 million. Okay. So it went all the way down and all the way back up and, and they're facing like deja vu. And so now here's the next part. Now it's not only just like the deferred sales trust, but it's vetting us it's vetting the structures, vetting the legality. They already knew they wanted to sell. They already knew the gains were there. They knew what it meant on the other side of, of this sale, which was no longer having to work for, for the tech company. She didn't have to be um, working as an attorney. They could spend time with their kids and their family, but they had to vet it. And so they went through this process of vetting it. And I did this, they did this for about two and a half, three months. Um, here's part of why, because they, we have never done, we have never done a, before them, we had never done, and I say we, my business partner, tax attorneys had never done a deferred sales trust, Bitcoin or Ethereum case. It's always only been businesses and real estate and, and dentists and orthodontists and car dealerships and artwork and collectibles and public stock and private stock and a number of things, but it had never been crypto. So we, it was kind of a new thing, but it was very similar to what we had before because it was an asset and it was subject to capital gains tax. And um, 
but this is their journey. They were, they were cautious too about how things would flow and, you know, how things are protected and making sure that, you know, we, we had all the 2FA authentication in and they had the cold storage. So a number of things we had to work out, but long story short, guess what happened? Ethereum dropped again. So at one point it went to 13 million and then it dropped back down to like six. And the same thing, a lot of those same feelings were coming up and they were super frustrated and like, oh my gosh, we're just, we're going through this whole thing. And, and his wife wanted to like go right away and Peter wanted to go too, but he wanted to be cautious about it. He wanted to be careful about it. So we put everything on pause. And so they had, by the time they said yes, and by the time they wanted to actually, we set up the, the Kraken account. And here's the other thing too, by the time we actually said, he said yes to the deferred sales trust structure and the time we actually formed the trust and then we actually opened up the Kraken account because by the way, Coinbase was a mess. They, we still haven't heard back from them. <laughs> Their customer service is so bad. And then, um, but Kraken was on it. They were, they were the one that actually, uh, now they put us through probably about 60 days of emails and due diligence on us and KYCs and, and the structure. And I mean, it was a whole, whole nother thing to overcome with them. And that was actually what stalled us, right? Had we gotten the Kraken account open, we could have sold it the 13 million and been good, but it was the Kraken part that stalled us. So everything falls apart, but we have at least Kraken open. We know that we have a plan in place, the legalities in place, and then the value slowly start to creep up again. And so it came basically to a, to a full, full circle here. It was a random Saturday. I'm driving from Sacramento to Walnut Creek, California. He, he lives in the East Bay, so not too far from Walnut Creek. And he calls me and I'm going for, I'm studying for an insurance exam to, to, to get uh, insurance license uh, referrals for a lot of clients that were sending different people's ways. And uh, he calls me and I'm like, what the heck? He's called me and it's, it's like 7.30 in the morning. And he's so, he, first of all, he texts me, he's so polite. He's like, hey, Brett, I know this is really early. I know this is random, but um, is there any way we can get together today? I know it's a Saturday. Um, there's Ethereum overnight hit 3000. And that was his target number. And we didn't think it hit three. It was at like 1700 or 1600 or 1500. We didn't think it hit 3000 for maybe three, four, five months, but within about a month, month and a half, boom, it hits again, hits it. So I'm like, I call him right away. I'm like, yes, but I'm not at a secure spot. I mean, I can get to a random Starbucks with a Wi-Fi, but we know that's not secure. Right. You always said to make sure we're in, in the home office or we're at the office and we have the wired connection. So everything's protected. He's like, how about you just give me the codes off the phone? I'll log in and we'll get this thing done. And so we went through this process over the next hour and we started with small amounts first, just to make sure everything was good. And then slowly, slowly, slowly within the next eh, three hours or so, 5 million was transferred um, of, of Ethereum to the Kraken account, which ended up in the deferred sales trust account. So I say all of that to say, this is why we're here and what we've built now and what we've gone on to, uh, what we're going on to do and we want to bring you along in this journey so that your confidence in the deferred sales trust and your ability to sell and exit um, speeds up, right? Because the one thing we can't get back is time. And we want to be able to help you capture your gains with the deferred sales trust when you want to, right? Not have to uh, feel like you have to go through a year long due diligence. Like we literally have the clients, the resources, the education, um, um, and we want to work with you. So all that being said, Pierce, you want to pull any nuggets out of that or any questions you have on that? Um, I think, you know, just, just to piggyback on the, on the ability to just kind of like capitalize. Cause I mean, in the crypto space, if, if you were in the crypto space in, in 2017, you were riding a high wave and then 2018 comes, you thought you didn't think that thing was ever going to come down and it came down hard real fast. And that, that was devastating for a lot of people. I got caught in that bubble for sure. You know? Um, and so the ability to just kind of like ride the wave up, capitalize, like buy low, sell high and not have to worry about the tax is like, it's really nice. Yeah. Well said. How about Mitch or Sean, any thoughts or questions on that deal or anything that I just talked about there? No, go ahead first, Mitch. I, you know, it, 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 this being the first case, uh, it might have been kind of a nail biter, I'm thinking, you know, like, will it actually go through? Um, what, what were the mechanics of, of making that transaction work uh, seamlessly? 
Biggest thing would be communication and the ability to connect well with the Kraken Exchange account, right? And so w once once we establish that the deferred sales trust is legal, it, it, the IRS track record, the you know the me, uh, us as the trustee, the bank accounts, like all of the stuff that again we've done now for collectively with the business partners for 25 years, thousands of closes, billions under management, like big big stuff, right? That's all been done. But it was new for it was new for crypto and getting Kraken on board. That was really the biggest thing, and it was just communication. So there's probably 70 or 80 emails back and forth between Peter and myself, the tax attorney, uh, the Kraken, the exchange, and just going all the way through. That just takes time, right? And, mm -hmm. and biggest thing was Kraken didn't know who we were, right? And they wanted to make sure we were legit and we weren't trying right. to, you know, launder money or or do something that we shouldn't be doing. And and they just had to vet us out, right? And and I, I applaud them because that's what they should be doing. Um, so I would say that was the biggest thing, Mitch, was just that communication. And, and again, I applaud them because they were very responsive. Um, it did take a little bit of pushing to, to get to the higher level of their customer service. But then we got a dedicated person now because we've gone on to do, um, to do a, a few more um, crypto deals, right? So that was the biggest thing, Mitch. And, that, and now do you feel like it, you have uh, a solid enough uh, platform that it, you can start to just be able to do these easily and you have since it's now been formatted and you have a, a a like a standard of operation procedure for this particular um you know entity being crypto um you guys would be able to do this in your sleep kind of after a while we do yeah because we've gone on to open up multiple accounts now with cracking with the deferred sales trust and part of the neat part about it is now that they've vetted capital gains tax solutions and the structure that that's, mm -hmm. that's like the first biggest roadblock and the trust. Mm -hmm. And that's the same blueprint every time, except it's a new trust that we set up a new EIN for, but it's right. the same capital gains tax solutions and the same trust new EIN for, for, for the new, you know, potential client who's going to be selling. So they got to right. vet them, but it basically we're just, it's like in a Rubik's cube. Right. And if you imagine every, every side needs to be lined up with the same colors. Right. And in the very beginning, every single side was completely discombobulated, right? And and now at least we have like two or three of the sides all the same color. So it's just a couple of those other ones as someone new is coming in and putting, you know, and making sure that they're fitting within what we're doing. So yeah, the answer is yes. We got our systems, we got our processes. In fact, we've been able to shrink the time it takes to open up a deferred sales trust Kraken account down to about seven days now. Okay. Wow. And the biggest thing is just the client, like Mitch, if it's your client who's coming in, them having all of their stuff in order, their KYCs and getting the trust opened up and we can open up trust in as typically as, as little as, as, as soon as a week. And then, and then, and then our goal is to open up as soon as we open that up, open up the Kraken trust account within a week. So within about 14 days, we can get everything opened up. The good news is we don't charge anything unless, and if the deal actually closes. So between the time that if your crypto is $5 million, it goes to four, you're not selling until it's at five. You don't owe us anything, right? We'll get everything in order. We'll walk through the structure, the integrity of, of who we are and our, the banks that we use and everything else. Um, we'll set up the trust account. We'll set it up at Kraken. If for some reason your deal doesn't close, you don't use the trust, you don't owe us anything, but the key is to get it all prepared and ready to go. Does that make sense, Mitch? Any questions there? Absolutely. No, no, that's good. My other question is, so you've had a few deals go down. How, how did they find out about the DST? How did they come to you? Did they all come to you or is this by couple and by word of mouth? What, what happened there? Yeah, I mean, we get referrals now. We're getting a lot of referrals. A lot of folks are finding us online or at the podcast or finding us on YouTube. And then they, they go and they download our ebook and then they start to get through the educational process. So mostly is it's um, it's inbound. They're coming to us as we as we educate and just just try to be as transparent and um, as open as we can without giving our secrets away because it is proprietary. It's protected structure. So most folks are finding us right as on these masterminds, Mitch, or through referrals. Okay, cool. Or they're business partners too, right? I mean, like Pierce is a, a luxury realtor down in Southern California, but he also runs and connects with business professionals and uh, business owners and crypto owners, right? And Mitch, you're a financial advisor in Colorado, so your clients. And so the biggest thing is just making people aware, like if you're a business professional and you're in real estate, it's asking that next question. Do you have any other highly appreciated assets that you're looking to sell? 
uh, you know, and, and if same thing, if you're a business broker or financial advisor, financial advisors typically are pretty, pretty broad. They're going to ask about all of their holdings, right? But right. making sure you're asking that extra question because you never know, they might be selling a $500,000 house or $1.5 million multifamily property, but they got $3 million worth of crypto, right? And right. they're not even telling you unless you ask them, right? And when you ask me, so what if you could trade or transfer the crypto into a trust, defer the tax and go buy real estate or invest in the stock market and, and, and keep your powder dry? Would that be of something that'd be of interest to you? And that, so that's what we also try to train and coach people who are in the, who are serving high net worth individuals, um, such as Sean. And, and Sean, uh, would you mind us too, again, your focus and where you're at? Sure. I'm in Los Angeles as well. Um, I have a, a real estate team. Uh, there's, I think, 11 of us right now. We're in multiple different states. Uh, most of us here in su sunny Southern California, although it's not so sunny right now, we're getting rained on big time, but we love it. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting in your opening. I'd like to just comment about something in your opening. Um, and I'll tell a quick little story. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my dad took me to Yellowstone and we went in these hot springs and we, it was a river and we got to swim in the river, but the river had, river had these boiling pockets of water. And it was like, cool, you swim in and out of the cold water into basically a natural hot tub. And it was a, a product of the, of, the, of the geysers and the vents there in Yellowstone. And I was 10 years old and we took a month trip around the United States. My dad was a truck driver. And so we, he took us out. We were gone for a month. We saw everything from uh, Massachusetts to the Grand Canyon to Alaska and back to Massachusetts and Yellowstone being there in the middle. And later on in life, I took my three kids. Uh, they were in there. You know, I was probably there in my 30, mid 30s at that time. And I went back to look for the hot springs. And I asked around and I looked online and I couldn't find anything about the hot springs. I knew I had been there, you know, I knew it existed, um, but nobody would share with me. Finally, I found a, a waitress at a restaurant that said, you know, they don't advertise it. They don't put it in any of the publications. They don't put any signs because if they did, the three and a half million people that come to Yellowstone every year would go to the hot springs and it would be ruined for everybody. And but it so she said, if you go to the north gate, you'll drive down the road before you get out of the gate, you'll see you'll see people with towels parked on the side of the road. And that's how you'll know you're there. And sure enough, I went and found it. And, and there were people there with towels. And we got to, I got to experience that with my kids in my 30s. And it was pretty cool. So I look at this as, you know, I talked to my real estate team and I, and I look at commercial real estate. I'm a resi commercial guy. I sell mostly residential, but I do do commercial. I've had the, in the 16 years, I've earned over a half a million dollars just in commercial commissions, all because I had a vocabulary around commercial. You know, I treated it as a lead generation strategy and just was open to the conversation. And those commissions came from selling somebody's residential home. And like you said, do you have any other highly appreciated assets that you'd like to just, you know, do something with? And just asking that question. And I came across, I sold a couple churches, I've sold a gas station, I've sold some multi-residential, uh, multi-family, multi-unit retail, all from those conversations that really started from residential. Um, I have a listing right now up in Mariposa, California, which is a, a equipment rental feed supply and, and landscape supply business that came from a Facebook ad that the gentleman was looking for homes in Mammoth that I was running. You know, so you never know where the business is going to come from. You got to be open to the conversation and you have to have a vocabulary around commercial to be even able, be able to have that conversation. So what I what I find interesting about this is that, you know, it's how Mitch, I'm not even sure where you got my information, but you contacted me and that's how I found about it. Mitch reached out. I responded. I don't respond to I get so many emails and phone calls of, of people trying to sell me leads and sell me the next greatest system. And, and I'm sure Pierce goes, you know, experiences the same thing. It's like three or three to five phone calls a day. And I know Brett, you're a real estate agent as well in my, one of your multiple verticals of, of business. Um, we don't say yes to everything, but we got to be looking for those things. And when I heard DST, I thought it was a Delaware statutory trust, which I was familiar with. 
uh, only because a, a business a business partner of mine who is a wealth advisor like Mitch shared with me. And um, then when he said, no, this is a deferred sales trust. And th- what, what jumped out at me was the ability to hold the asset and but you know, maintain ownership basically, right? Because I've had clients that have had forty-five, uh, have done ten thirty-one exchanges, where you literally have forty-five days to identify, you know, the next property, and it just doesn't work. I've had multiple different clients that were so, so rushed to buy that next asset that they they actually jumped on and did did a did a transaction with a different agent. I had invested a bunch of time, so it's actually cost me money. Um, you know, because of the way the 1031 exchange is designed. So I don't really have a question. I just, I just want to say that it's totally cool. Can you hold it? Like, let's say you bought an airplane for a half a million dollars. Let's say you had a million dollars come out of a a property transaction and you put it into the trust. Could you buy an airplane and the trust would maintain ownership just like you're doing with the Ethereum? The trust owns the, owns the asset. It's still there, right? But it's gone from Ethereum into now whatever other investment you want the trust directs it into, which the owner of the trust is, there's a trustee, you, and then there's the owner. So am I understanding that part correctly? So if we use an Close. analogy of an airplane, mm-hmm. could I use the airplane, but the trust owns it, and I, and I, and I, I deferred the capital gains on that, in the process. Yeah, so it's very close. And there's some key things to understand about this. And by the way, I, I really appreciate your Yellowstone analogy. I think that's really, really uh, neat, you know? And you said three and a half million people, if they knew about it, they came to Yellowstone every year, they'd literally ruin it because it, it, it'd just be too many people. And that's in fact why certain tax referral strategies in the past, part of it because they're not necessarily doing it right. But second, they if you listen to the David Young video in the very beginning of this, uh, this uh, broadcast, this webinar, or this mastermind, He talked about it's a two-edged sword, right? Where if too many people are are using it and or if there's too many people that are using it improperly or even just a few that are using it improperly, they they press the boundaries, right? They don't use a third-party unrelated trustee. They're not in it for business purpose. They're using it for personal things such as like a primary home or potentially like a personal airplane, right? It'd be taxable, right? It's not legit. Like just like an IRA or a 401k, the IRS has those in place and says, hey, as long as you put it for retirement, business, and investment purposes, and as you receive, you'll pay tax on that. Hey, we're totally cool with that. That's be- Why? Because it's going to spur economic growth. So same thing with the deferred sales trust, but same thing with your, Yellow- your Yellowstone hot springs, right? If too many people find out about it or abuse it or take advantage of it or just do something, it could potentially ruin the entire thing, right, with the ecosystem or whatever that might be. I'm not an expert in that kind of, that kind of thing, right? But, um, but that is the essence of the deferred sales trust. And so we want to make sure that it's protected. It's done properly, uh, but it's been proven. Now to answer your extra question about ownership um, versus being a lender, okay? Understand that the structure of the strategy, how this actually works and why it's not a Delaware statutory trust because a Delaware statutory trust is just another form of a 1031. In fact, I call it the Hollywood video to the Blockbuster 1031. It's just that other, other. Uh, it's a little slight nuance of the 1031 where you're continuing owning something and you're trading a smaller property for a bigger property, okay? And you're maintaining ownership. Whereas the four, IRC 453 and why it's the Fertile Sales Trust is not a 1031 is because it's a separate tax code and you're becoming the lender. So it's truly exiting the position to take a promissory note to be paid back slowly over time. So in that scenario, now, can you become a lender again, or can you become an owner again? Yes, and this is the proprietary protected way in what we, which we do this, but essentially you can go back in partnership with the trust and you can purchase real estate, right? Or purchase a airplane, that's a business airplane, right? That, that is, or purchase a, a rental, because I get questions a lot like, well, what if I bought it like a beach house? And I'm like, well, is it a rental? Yeah, it's a rental. Okay, as long as it's a rental, and now if you happen to visit it once a year to make sure it's not you know burned down, right, and make sure that everything's going well, like that's fine. It's just what's the nature of it? If you're gonna, uh, what we don't want to do is to to do anything that's going to go outside the boundaries of these things. So if it's an airplane that you're gonna fly around, Sean, and uh, a few times a year, but the majority of the time it's being rented out as a business, right? Or if I'm using it, if I'm using it for business. 
So it's that's different, right? So you got to be careful not to draw the lines. Now, like you could say, well, I'm a trucker and I and I am in a trucking company, right? I run a trucking company and I want to want to partner with a trust to open a trucking company and I bought a truck and equipment. Yeah, as long as it's legitimately a business, right? It's not a it's not a it's not a funny business where you're where you're saying, right. yeah, it's really just I I like to have a personal private jet and I want to have a big old ride off. So it's you just got to be careful because this is this is your money. It's also our it's also all our structure, right? So we want to be very conservative in our approach. I want to bring in Jake Mullen here, by the way, who's a business partner, financial advisor, and extraordinaire. Jake, you have any thoughts on this? I, I would just come out and say that there's more than one way to skin the cat, and there's good, better, and best. And uh, Brett is my trustee of choice in the strategy because he always tries to help clients lean more towards the best. <clears throat> and that is the more conservative side of over documenting things, being 100% legit and making sure that everything has intent for in, if in case the IRS ever re reviews anything. Now, there, there's two reasons Brett does that. One is, of course, if they're looking at the trust, they're not looking at you. If they're looking at the trust, they're looking at him. And so he wants to make sure that everything's on board because he's the one taking all the liability and risk. The other thing is, Absolutely, the trust can do a number of wonderful things ongoing, like buy that plane and different things. However, you know, it just really depends on what the intent of the purchase of the plane is for. If it's 100% personal use, well, then, I mean, my goodness, that doesn't really work out. But if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, and you want to continue to invest and reinvest, and you need a, a means of moving around, and a plane happens to fit the bill, then there's good, better, and best, a number of different ways that that can actually happen. And Brett will always show you and tell you about the very best way. And yeah, and that's to, the, to that point, by the way, too, people want to know if you're selling Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, can I go invest back into cryptocurrency, right? And the answer is yes as well. And that's the beauty of the Deferred Sales Trust. Can I invest back into real estate? Yes. Can I invest into a business? In fact, Jake and I's client recently for one of our another uh, cryptocurrency sales, she had all Bitcoin. Uh, she worked for Google. And part of her dream was to start and own a business with her um, her roommate and good friend, an educational online platform, and also to re retire from the W two Google job, right? Um, and so she did that as a part, and we helped to aid in that transition as she transferred the Bitcoin and was able to exit her position and receive a promissory note. And as a part of that, she's able to fund. Uh, with 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 uh, with uh, with some of those funds fund her business venture all tax deferred of which she's an owner in, and that's the beauty. So we call it lendership, Sean, where you can, you're a lender at first, and then you can become an owner again, right? And there's all those little nuances that we want to follow. We want to keep keep you safe. We want to make sure you're not stepping on a landmine, <laughs> but as well help you be as entrepreneur as you can because we are entrepreneurial real estate financial advisors, cryptocurrency owners, business owners. So does that answer the question, Sean? Or any thoughts on that? It, no, it does. And I think, um, you know, being a lender versus an owner, again, it's about the vocabulary around it. I just, one of the clients that I, I, I have two clients right now that potentially could benefit from this. And one of them just, you know, is going to bite the bullet and, and pay 400,000 in taxes instead of even having a conversation around it. Like, you know, I sent her to her CPA just to set up a, a you know, a conference call and she wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't, uh, it's, it's, it's a interesting situation. A trust sold, sold the property and there's the, the, the trustee is, you know, kind of at the, at the end of their life and they're not completely there mentally. And the family is kind of running things and they just don't have the vocabulary around it or the ability to even be willing to take a look at it. So maybe speak to that a little bit about, you know, how do you have somebody have the idea like, Hey, that, that hot spring really exists. You know, come to come take a look at it with me. That's a great point. Right? We'll use that analogy because they go, but I look it up on the internet, Sean, and and, and I went to the exist, you know yeah. the the travel guide who's who's they've been in you know uh, in in Montana, right? Or they've been there yeah. for twenty years and they've never heard of it, right? Yeah. And they're like, or whatever, whatever state they might be in, it's like, but doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and and people haven't been enjoying it and using it for years and decades and decades and decades. So that what we found, there's really a big thing going on emotionally and intellectually, right? So logically, you can literally give somebody the most amount of information and evidence, like thousands of closes, billions under management, David Young, you know, he worked for Bill Gross and Pimco and all of their due diligence for two years and 
And myself and Marcus and Millichap thinking we were the Navy SEALs of investment real estate and brokerage and 1031 exchanges and, and national law firms. And, and you, can, you can tell someone to the boo of the face, but emotionally they don't necessarily know you yet or maybe as well as maybe you thought they did and or their CPA emotionally has already connected with them in a way that they know, like, and trust them more. So it's hard for them to take their, your logic. And then you couple that with the perfect storm of their selling, probably their most precious asset, which represents their most, their retirement, their future, their financial legacy. Cause we're often meeting people at the top of their exit, right? Meaning it's the last 5% before they exit. And the last 95% they've been with that CPA or that real estate professional or whoever who doesn't know about it. And so you have all of that. And now it's this window of time that's squeezed. They got to make it. Typically people are finding us 30 days before they sell. And so it's new people, it's new tax, it's IRS. It kind of feels scary. So emotionally it's hard for them to overcome the idea that their professional doesn't know about it. Right. And this is where I'd say, it's best to not to try to overcome with logic. It's best to just tell a story, right? Mm -hmm. To help them. To, it's a better story than what they have told themselves or what their CPAs told them. <laughs> Second thing to do is to say, Hey, we, it's totally cool. Your CPA is not on board or doesn't understand it. Would you at least have them come on and express those concerns because they're the brain surgeon and we have some other brain surgeons and let's let them talk and don't let them off the hook. Just to, just to dismiss it, no, because A, they're too busy, because a lot of CPAs are really busy right now, right? And B, maybe you won't pay them money to get on, like make sure you write that check to spend for their time and energy, but at least get them on, because we found is when we get the CPA actually in a conversation and we're in dialogue and we're pre presenting evidence and we're answering the questions, that it actually, nine out of 10 times, they'll actually say yes, Sean, and they'll bring us more clients. But what the client doesn't do sometimes, they're looking for an easy way out. And it's, it's, it's like human nature, right? It's like the upper brain and the lower brain. And it's that safety that if I can at least call somebody and say, I'm really concerned, like this isn't going to work. isn't legal. Like you're looking for a way for them to sit, to confirm that, that, that bias. Like, yeah, I'd stay away from it too, because the CPA also doesn't have any vested interest in this thing. If you think about it, if they've never seen or heard about it, what happens if they say yes and it works? Well, yeah. they may or may not get much kudos for that. Right. I mean, but if they say yes and it doesn't work, guess what? It's going to go all on them and they're going to feel like they're liable, but we're not asking them to, to, to do the audit defense. We're not asking them to do anything else. And that's, that's, that's the thing we work with every day. Sean, is that making some sense or any, any questions does, or thoughts totally. on that? No, no, it totally makes sense. Jake, do you want to add anything to that? You know, I would. And <clears throat> this comes from an experience of working with a lot of CPAs from across the country. Um, actually it was, part of a very large program where we taught about tax advantage wealth management strategies, um, deferred sales trust being one of those amongst many others. And absolutely, you have some people that view it as competition and they get all defensive and everything else. And it's just like a first date. You got to break the ice, right? If you can get them to the table, if you can get them to show up, then we can talk, we can talk tax. We can talk RIFC. We can talk precedent cases. We can talk, you know, everything under the sun and we can look at each other eye to eye and usually 90% of the time all feel better about it. Um, we play well with other professionals. We don't view other professionals as competitors. We don't take their business, right? I mean, we're offering what we're offering and we're helping people with this side of things. And we prefer that their trusted advisor is right next to them, holding their hand, helping them along the way, because as they hear us talk, oftentimes they're nodding their head and saying, you know, this makes sense because they understand mm -hmm. it better than the client does. So their right. estate planning attorney, their tax attorney, their CPA, their internal account, their CFO, their board of directors, whoever it is. We once presented <clears throat> Brett to, I think, a room um, for one company, a physician group, and there were 17 people, all doctors and owners with like their each individual personal invited person. And it was a little chaotic as far as Zoom call goes, but everybody that was important from a decision-making standpoint was there. And we made sure everybody understood what the deferred sales trust was, what it could do for them, how it was applicable, how it could be customized to a certain extent for their specific situation. 
and how the transaction could occur in a non-taxable way. And we absolutely like to work with other professionals. They, they just have to understand that we're not making them look bad. We're not taking business from them, that we're here to help them do something bigger and better, something that we specialize in, something that they maybe have heard about or maybe haven't heard about, what have you. But we're all here to be on the same page with the client because the client now is doing something they haven't done very many times before or maybe not at all. And so yeah. they're going through a new experience. They got to bring new team members, us, to the table to work with their current team members to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, Sean, any thoughts on that? Any questions there? No. And the last thing I would just just say ahead. is the stories. I mean, literally, I haven't heard of this before. Oh, well, you know what? Last week, this guy just sold a warehouse in California, $2.4 million. And they did this, you know? So they haven't heard of someone. We'll tell them about somebody who just did it. And you can get all of those stories from Brett's uh, podcast here. And uh, those are all people that have given permission for us to share their story. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Cool. And then uh, there's a principle I'm reading from a book called from Ray Dalio. And he talks, it's a book called Principles. And he's talked about trading the joy. He, had a, he has to practice, and I think we all have to practice, of trading the joy of being right for the joy of what's true, right? And it's, it's that intersection of, of ego and bias and keeping an open mind and asking questions and being curious, right? And again, it's tough for a client if they're already about to close. In their mind, they've already wrote the check, they have to pay the tax, right? And so it's like, oh, it was a foregone conclusion. Now you're telling me it's not? It's like a, it's a big, it can be a, a barrier to, um, um, yeah. to, to their ego, to, to everything that's going on. And so we wanna, this is why we're here, we're trying to like, Tell everybody, hey, this works. Come check it out. Like Educate. we wish we would have known. Like we wish we would have known in 08, 07, 06 before the 08 crash. And then for our crypto folks, we wish we would have known before the 2017 crash that we could have done it for this. And we did actually did know. It just crypto came on so fast that we just weren't focused on it. But now we are like a laser. And so if you want to learn more about any of this and you have a live deal worth $1 million net proceeds, $1 million gain or more, and this is who really it's for. Anyone has an LLC, S Corp, C Corp, business sale, uh, crypto sale. Um, we're working on some decentralized deals right now, some really big ones. Working on some NFT sales right now. So lots of lots of things happening. We're still on the forefront. We've already closed the Ethereum. We've closed the Bitcoins. We're closing um, cases, and we're closing uh, another another um, another like tw twenty different coins coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So it's here. But you got to take action. You want to go to capitalgainstaxrooms.com. Also, if you have that skeptical CPA, bring them on to the to the webinar. Bring them on to here, and let's talk about it. Let's let's open up the dialogue. Let's present some evidence, and let's all get in the get in the circle because we're still learning too of involving ways to be making sure we're doing this um, in a way that continues to stay consistent with the with the guidelines of 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 the IRS and everything else. That being said, so we've talked about vision. We talked about some deal close stories. Any other questions from Mitch, from Sean, from Pierce, uh, for any live deals you guys are working on, for any other any other things that you think it might be helpful for the audience or for you right now? I'd just like to say your your ego is not your amigo. That's good. <laughs> and another one that taken from Grant Cardone, which I know you've probably seen some of his stuff, Brett being part of EXP. Yeah. But Brent, Grant owns over 8,000 units and he teaches in his real estate, uh, one of his real estate courses, the exit, no exit. And that's what this is, seems to be similar to. It's an exit, no exit. So walk us through that, Sean. So I'm not sure, quite sure I follow that, but that'd be good. Tell, what does he mean by that? Or what do you mean by that? So exit, no exit is a strategy he uses where he buys a, a, a you know, an undervalued property. And as it appreciates, you know, he pulls the equity out of it. Ah. And it's rented. These are rentals. So he's got over 8,000 doors, which is incredible. And, um, you know, he pulls the equity out of there as a, as, as a loan. And the tenants are paying the payments because the rents in the area have appreciated. So he calls the strategy his exit, no exit. I like it. Yeah, there's also like the burst strategy, right? You're going to buy. You're going to renovate. You're going to refinance. And you're going to repeat, right? I think those, I might be missing one of them, but yep. but, it's, yep. but essentially, it's it's uh, if you've never if you never sell and real estate, I think it it's 
if you don't take on too much debt, that's the other thing you're making. So you're keeping your, your debt to income ratio, uh, your DCR in, in, in check, right? And you're not over leveraging or not having get to a spot where you don't have a lot of liquidity. Um, so a number of things to get, take a factor there, but yeah, you're right. Cause a debris finance is not a taxable event, right? Um, it's not until you sell that you have the taxable event. And in the meantime, you can get depreciation and Grant Cardone does a cool video on this on commercial real estate and taxes and using depreciation to help move your income down to zero. And, um, and using that in conjunction with the deferred sales trust is also another powerful way to do this. But, but yeah, I, I, I think that's, uh, I think that's great. You be careful with crypto, right? Because people are leveraging and or hedging and or uh, doing um, staking because of the rapid drops. Generally speaking, real estate for the most part goes up, generally speaking, right? Especially if it's multifamily value add, you know, you have 100, 200 units, you have a lot of insulation from by the time people actually are going to be vacating your property, right? So there's analysis that you'll do when you're doing multifamily investing of at what point can I make my payment? How many... If I have a hundred units, if it goes 20 of them go vacant, will I still be able to make my payment? That's a good, good kind of risk uh, test to do, or is it 15 or is it 10? Right. And you want to be, you want to be somewhere, you know, ideally you, you don't, it's 20% or more vacancy before you can't make your payment. Right. So it gives you a lot of room to make a lot of deals. And so, but as a part of that, as you increase the rents, as you increase the value, then you can capture new appraised value, refinance your equity out or a large percent of it, of it, use that as a down payment to go buy another one and then do the same thing. Here's the key though, you gotta make sure you're buying value add, right? You're not just buying top of the market where the rents have been squeezed all the way to the height and there's not a lot of room for improvement, which means there's not a lot of room for error. So these are all these little parts. If you have another Rubik's cube here, right? That we wanna help you here is how you're going to be investing the funds. And that's part of where Jake Miller comes in as a financial advisor. Mitch Bloom comes in as a financial advisor. And, and then me as a commercial real estate advisor expert to help make this thing really fly for everybody. So um, make any, any questions or thoughts on that, Sean? No. Yeah. That's and good. Sean too, by the way, Sean can help you buy, buy stuff too. So down in SoCal <laughs> and Pierce. That being said, we're at 1050. So we have 10 more minutes. Pierce or Mitch, any other questions or thoughts? All right now. I mean, this is really helpful. Um, you know, going back to the CPA, I think it's uh, there's really a challenge in in reversing, you know, their thought in saying, you know, that you know this isn't going to work because I just haven't heard heard about it before. I, I've never seen this before. But I think one point we might want to clarify is that when a CPA comes on board for their client and says, hey, this DST really does make sense, what they could be doing is they, they could be locking in their own client for another 10, 20, or 30 years by helping them facilitate the trust. So I think that's one thing we might have missed. I don't know. I'm so new at this. So, um, But this could become leverage. This could become an advantage. You know, Again, just trying to reverse that thought for the CPA. Look, this could be to your advantage of incorporating this trust into your practice because you're locking in this client for possibly another 10, 20 or 30 year segment. Yeah, it's a great point. Does that, does, that, does that ring like it makes sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. He's adding value, solving problems. That's all we're in the business to do. So Jake, any last thoughts uh, for the audiences and also remind them where they can find you too. Yeah, I, I would just add at the end of the day because we've talked a lot about kind of the, uh, psychology of communicating the deferred sales trust with people and clients, helping them understand that we really have no need to sell this strategy. We just want to educate people, teach them, help them understand it. So we need to communicate effectively and help them overcome any type of ulterior motives or ulterior incentives. And uh, obviously being completely transparent about all the fees and just being there to help them understand how this may or may not be an eligible transaction for them to participate in. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing that we try to do. And in the uh, <clears throat> spirit of Christmas, which is tomorrow, you know, um, we're here to give people knowledge. We're here to help them uh, understand whether or not this is something that they could participate in and uh, help them maintain the investment power of, of today's asset. Because if they were to sell this asset today, and incur all those taxes and have to chop things up and give parts away to various government agencies, then 
they lose their purchasing power, they lose their investment power. Not all of it, of course, but it decreases uh, based on what they would have to share with, with everyone else. And the deferred sales trust, what it allows them to do is to continue to reinvest net of attorney fees rather than net of taxes. And it helps them to do more from an investment standpoint with their current dollars. And that's what we try to help people do. Um, if people want to reach out and find us, uh, alphamarktax.com, alphamark with a P-H, A-L-P-H-A-M-A-R-K, tax.com. There's a little schedule now link, um, 1-800-773-1848. And, uh, or just come show up here every Friday. This is where um, all of us are, and we like to take any questions. And, and uh, we, we have, always have a, a client of the week to, to spotlight and showcase. And so this is where we share our knowledge. Perfect. Thanks, Jake. And Pierce, if people want to get connected with you, where can they find you? You can find me at kingdomluxuryrealty.com. And uh, you can set up a strategy call and stuff with us there. And yeah, definitely the best way to find me. Awesome. Mitch, how about you? Financial Advice 360 or call me at 800 Way Cool with a K. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. Sean. Uh, cell phone 310-993-4350 or... Uh, Policino Real Estate, which is P O L I S E N O real estate.com. And you can see the name right there on the screen. Awesome. If anyone wants to connect with uh, with me, you can go to capital gains tax solutions.com. You can check us out on iTunes as well. We're having amazing guests on the show all the time. Mitch is actually coming up here, I think, in about a month. Jake's been on the show. Pierce has been on the show. Sean, we got to get you on the show, highlight what you're doing there. But we bring on people like hey, Kevin you. Harrington from Shark Tank and all these other amazing, smart people. And we ask them what they're doing with their tax deferral strategies and you know, uh, how they're building business and leadership and wealth. And that's Capital Gains Tax Solutions. You can search that on iTunes or Spotify. And again, please invite, bring somebody here next week and continue to get educated. Um, and again, if you have a live deal worth a million dollar net proceeds and a million dollar gain, or two deals at $500,000 each, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with myself or one of my team members and or, and, or, and or Jake, and we can kind of go through this entire process with you. We so appreciate everyone out there, and we wish you a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year, and we will talk to everybody again real soon, and uh, goodbye. Merry Christmas. See you. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye. All right, fellas. Hey, Brett. Yes, I'm.